Thank you, uh, Baroness Blake. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a formal welcome to everybody here to Headingley today for this uh, special celebratory uh, lunch. A celebration of yet another heritage project uh, for Headingley Stadium. And as I'm sure you've already detected, we're very proud of our history and uh, heritage here at the club. Uh, we're quite proud of the history and heritage of the Leeds Rugby League Club, uh, of the stadium, and indeed of the game of Rugby League. And uh, once all our stadium development was completed a couple of years ago, we really focused in on uh, on the heritage and uh, and to be able to showcase, uh, as I say, what is a very rich uh, heritage of, of, of the club. Uh, at the heart of our heritage agenda is that Leeds Rhinos Foundation. So I'm delighted today that uh, the Chief Exec, Bob Bowman, and its Chairman, Phil Kaplan, are both with us. But they do have a heritage committee, and that's a group of about and seven or eight what you would call rugby league anoraks and these are the sort of people who know everything there is to know about the game and they come and they, miss, they meet in the cafe bar and they will argue for half an hour on the attendance of the game in 1946 for example and one of them will be absolutely spot on so they do know everything and they, they've provided so much valuable information and, uh, and resource so far. And I'd also like to play tribute to two people in particular. There's all the people actually contributed to, to what you've seen this morning, but there are two in particular. Uh, one is our very own uh, uh, media manager, uh, Phil Daly. And actually it was his brainchild to create the timeline of the game, right from 1890 to, to cover all the, all the aspects and the major events that's taking place at Hedley here of the game, which of course, 26 clubs are featured uh, along that timeline, all the major internationals. And then Ken Hughes, now Ken Hughes, he's from St. Helens, uh, but we shouldn't hold that against him. Uh, I was talking to Eamon McManus about this probably two years ago, uh, and Eamon said, oh, well, the guy who did all our stuff at, uh, at the new stadium at St. Helens, he says, Bloke, he says, he does a great job, he says, but he won't do yours. I said, oh, no, he said, no, he says, he's St. Helens through and through. I said, well, that's a challenge. Let me have a chat with him. Anyway, lo and behold, Ken come on board. Because uh, not only is he a St. Helens fan, but he's a rugby league fan as well. And when we talked to Ken about what we got in mind, he actually threw himself and indeed his company into it. So all the imagery uh, and the creative that you see downstairs, that's all the, produ the, the produce of Ken and his uh, vinyl business in St. Helens. Yeah, I can remember the first time I ever played it. It was as a schoolboy. Um, I think we, we played, um, we did play as a curtain raiser though for Stanley once against, uh, I think it was, might have been Pudsey back then um, when they were a lot younger. But yeah, I mean, I've got great memories of coming here and just we've watched some of the old footage there. It was just uh, for a long period of time, it didn't really change it, did it? from about 1950 till about 2000 until Gary and uh, Paul really took over. Then the changes start, started to happen. But yeah, I mean, I've got great memories of being here. It is just such an historic ground. So the first part of ca captures the first part of the, the tunnel captures the history of the Leeds Club, but we always know that the centrepiece uh, was going to be the tunnel walls leading out to the pitch, and it was finally decided by those uh, those who matter that that should be a f that should feature the game's most legendary and iconic players who have played at Headingley. Now that in itself is interesting because when you look at the iconic and historic players uh, that's played rugby league, almost every one of them has all played as Headingley. This is the only ground in the world that can lay claim to hosting all the game's legendary players because all the grounds that used to host test matches and internationals and indeed cup finals, grounds like Far Town and Central Park and Station Road, well, they're long since gone. So this is the only place in the world that's hosted all the game's legendary players. I did come quite close to signing for Leeds uh, back in 1991. Obviously, I was in um, dispute with witness for half a season, so I was out of the game, people don't remember, for half a season. Um, so I did a lot of uh, kicking my heels. I obviously had spoken to Morris Lindsay. I knew we were interested, and Dougie knew obviously what I'd done at, uh, at witness, as he was the guy who brought me into the game and signed me. I remember meeting uh, Dougie at a, a service station, uh, and we had a chat, and uh, if I'm honest, you know, what he was offering me was more than what um, Wigan were offering me. But um, I was uh, fixed on um, uh, playing at Wembley. Obviously, Wigan had had the four years straight. You know, I, I was uh, hell bent on, on playing for Wigan in the Challenge Cup, and uh, you know, thankfully I got to achieve that. Now I wondered. It occurred to me just last night about how many players have played at Headingley, how many professional players. 
So I sent a text to a guy who, whose opinion who I, uh, uh, I uh, respect. I asked him the same question. He reckoned there could be as many as 50,000. Uh, when you think about it, all the professional players that's played here over the last 131 years, I actually think that's a high, I think that's the number on the high side. Uh, but uh, I reckon it's nearer 30,000 players. But that's a lot of players, isn't it? 30,000 professional players have all played at Headingley since 1895. Yeah. I think probably the most memorable kind of game would be the last one you know I ever played in against Saints in, in the playoffs because I, I think you, the crowd yeah, I think it was the sellout and there was so many people in there you know probably I've got first or second you know uh, touch two you know and, and for me I think it was just it, it was an amazing day um, it was a really really difficult game to play in and to finish with the last game ahead and I was ever going to play for Leeds to win to go to a grand final uh, was just incredible and just the atmosphere that day was what Edinley is all about absolutely pumping and, and full of people that kind of I, I knew or just in and around the city of Leeds as well so that's my favourite kind of game and, and of those 30,000 how many are what you would call legendary players how many of those players made, made their mark in the game and are remembered remembered forever in some cases uh, and, what, and, and to their own fans to fans of rugby league I think the answer is probably about a tenth about what, about 300? Uh, that's, that's, that's 1%, isn't it? Yeah. I will never that good at maths. About 1% of those 30,000 are actually players who anybody would argue that they are iconic players, they are legendary players, uh, they were international players of the highest order, they made their mark in the game, whenever it was. It might have been in 1895, it might have been in the early 1900s, it might have been in, re in, the, in recent past. I think I uh, scored a, a length of the, the field interception try, I think, here at Henley against, um, against Leeds. Last tackle, says the referee. Leeds then, Schofield, Crooks. Hope Martin a fire, has taken an intercept and has 75 yards to go for the try. This time he will not be caught. Martin a fire races towards the Leeds post to a tremendous salute from the witness bank of fans. And here today, we have uh, delighted that some of those legendary players are here with us today. Uh, we have Carol Millward, and of course, Roger passed away several years ago, but I'm delighted that Carol is with us today, along with a very, very good friend, uh, Malcolm Reilly. And it's so apt, and it, it, at least I don't think that this was by design, but Malcolm and Re Roger were great pals, grew up together, played at Castleford together, uh, grew up together and played for Great Britain for, together for so, for, for so long. Uh, lived, lived next door to each other, both from the same village. Uh, and uh, both, uh, both Malcolm, his wife Sue, and Carol all sat on the same table. So welcome, Malcolm Reilly, and to Carol Millward. It's incredible, yeah, I, I'm privileged and very honoured. You always have to be very mentally prepared. I know I'd, you know, the players I was playing against and I knew they didn't like me. <laughs> but people like Ray Batten, you know, some super players uh, going right through the lead squad. And uh, yeah, there were always tough encounters and uh, I was very privileged to be able to play against them. We've got Martin Afire. More, more as well to, to the more modern day players, which are it's a fire, of course, uh, 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 would acclaim both here in England and indeed in Australia throughout the world. And a great, a great favourite, not necessarily of the Leeds fans, I have to say. That was a great honour. Um, if uh, you know, after I rejected the offer from Doug Lawton back in 1991 to come to Leeds, if someone would have told me that uh, I'd get my uh, my mugshot on the wall of the players' tunnel at Headley uh, after all the damage I've done to Leeds, scoring 10 tries and, and those uh, Wembley uh, Challenge Cup finals, I would probably say Headley is probably not a place I'll get my picture put up on the wall. <laughs> Martin is here and he's on the same table and table two along with one of the, the youngest players to be inducted into this uh, prestigious group. Uh, but uh, we're delighted that Jamie Peacock's been able to be here today. So to Jamie and to Martin on table four. Yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing that over 30,000 players have played in it and to be included in, you know, the top 30, it's just really, really special and really humbling for me. I, I hadn't thought much about it until we actually came to the dinner today and when Gary mentioned those numbers there, 
it's just um, yeah, it's a huge, huge honour um, for myself. And, and again, I, I come back to the other word I used before. It's just humbling. It's humbling to be uh, in the company of the people who are, who are on the world, people who are, who are my idols growing up, but then people beyond them and beyond them who, you know, the people who were at the start of the game who, you know, who have got man of the matches and um, and these like the trophies named after them. It's just just amazing. And just going back a few years before Jamie and Martin, uh, back into the, in what many people would say is the halcyon days of, of rugby league, the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and such names here on table one as Neil Fox, the World Rugby League record point scorer, which will take some beating, I think we'd all agree with that, at 6,220 points. We've got uh, one of his great adversaries, Billy Boston, played together, of course, uh, for Great Britain on so many occasions. And going back even further than them to is of course Lewis Jones made his debut at, 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 at Leeds back in 1952 having already established himself uh, in rugby union so delighted to see Lewis, Billy and Neil Whilst Old Trafford may be the theatre of dreams and Wembley the venue of legends for rugby league Headingley is the home of history a spiritual ground that's witnessed some of the most epic action and defining characters. That's why it's so important to preserve the past. And despite its recent £42 million refit, this ground still carries the resonance and atmosphere that goes back 130 odd years to its unveiling in 1890. The turf may have been relayed, but the pitch still carries those memories of momentous deeds. The plan in the company of eminent Professor Tony Collins is to look at five matches and four personalities that have graced the former Lot 17A of the Cardigan Estate to tell the story of why where we sit this afternoon is so special and unique. So Sheffield and Huddersfield led the way. Um, they had dual sport grounds. But the ambition was to build the nation's most prestigious multi-sport facility here. Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, if, you, if you go back to 1890 when, when Headingley opened, it really was seen as the premier sports ground in England. And, and it probably was, outside of London. Um, the, the range of facilities are unprecedented. The range of sports that it offered because it had a cycling track, uh, it staged soccer matches, uh, as well as rugby and obviously, obviously cricket. So as a, as a centre for sporting and stadium excellence, Headingley set the tone in the 1890s. So it was the, the, uh, the preeminent English Victorian sports stadium. And a venue like this demanded events from as soon as it was built. Um, there's a blue plaque uh, on the wall near the ticket office commemorates the first ever Challenge Cup final and the first test match. And 1897, the first Challenge Cup final, we've got footage of 1903. That was um, Halifax 7, Salford nil, 32,500 fans, which was a new attendance record for the sport of Northern Union. Uh, Mitchell and Kenyon filmed it. Salford are in the dark shirts, for those of you watching in colour, and um, Halifax are, appear to be in the, uh, in the blue and white hoops, as usual. Um, at this point in, in, in rugby league, a scrum was formed after every tackle. Uh, there was no play of the ball, they were still playing 15 a side, so it kind of just evolving out of rugby union towards what we know as rugby league. The other notable thing about this, as Phil said, uh, Halifax won the Cup 7-0. It was the two best teams in the league. Uh, Halifax finished top of the championship and Salford finished second. But despite that, and despite the massive crowd, it was seen as a very, very dull game. There were over 100 scrums in the match until we get to 1906 when they finally bite the bullet and the league votes to move to 13 a side and to introduce a play the ball after every tackle. And that change really brought rugby league, the Northern Union, into line with the way that the people who had founded the game in 1895 wanted to see it develop. And it's a similar sort of story with France as well, if we, we move on to their contribution. Um, the arrival here at Headingley of Jean Gallier in the, the mid-30s, learnt the game from Jim Bruff and, and Joe Thompson, who were both in the Leeds Hall of Fame, um, ostracised by the union authorities. And even after the disgrace of the, the Vichy government sequestering all the assets during World War II, a bit like today when there's a renaissance in French rugby league, the 1950s is a golden era. We've got a clip of France coming over and playing England in 1950, but, but that period 
Um, not only did they revolutionise the way the game was played, but the Australians in particular really took to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in 1951, the, the French team went to, and I'm sure many people here know this, 1951, the French team toured Australia um, for the first time. They, uh, and they defeated Australia in test series. This is the 1950, this is basically the French team that went over to Australia a year later and defeated the Australians. So you've got great players, uh, Puis Jobet, number one there, um, and his, uh, Edouard Poncinet, who's a great second rower. Uh, in fact, England won 14-9, which is a good result given where the, uh, the way the French would play uh, 18 months later. And so that's really the classic French team, and they played very much in, in John Gallier's in John Gallier's spirit. I mean, that was England playing France, um, yeah. but two years before, uh, and in the aftermath of the global conflict, and despite austerity, Trevor Foster scored um, the first ever try recorded for Great Britain here. So here's the kangaroos arriving at Headingley, 1948. Um, that's the Australian High Commissioner who just got with the uh, um, uh, is it a Homburg hat? I think this is probably the first colour film um, of a rugby league match. There may be a, a f colour film of seven size at, um, at Odsall during the war. Famous old concrete ramp at Headingley yeah. that most of the players in the room will have run down at some stage. Yeah, I mean, it was there until very recently, wasn't it? Again, we should say there's 36,500 people yeah. here, which if you think of Headingley today and the capacity being just short of 20,000, to have almost double that in. Uh, you'd have been certainly packed together. Yeah, and that, I think that's an amazing thing about these crowds, that you could have massive crowds in stadiums that you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have in the future. You couldn't get that size of crowd in any stadium because of the stadium. Now, yeah, the Australians did a hacker. This is the, allegedly an Australian Aboriginal war cry, which I'm sure people can remember. Uh, I think the last time they did it was on the 67 tour. But yeah, um, it's not going to put fear into anybody there. Numbers easier to see than they are today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Ledge out at number one. Again, you get a sense of whilst Headingley is still the same, it, it has changed as well. The, the old north stand with the, the paddock at the front and the big roof over the top. So one of the things that always strikes you as odd from a modern perspective is how cavalier players are about keeping... Oh, Stan McCormick, classic Stan McCormick try. He ran like he was a, a, a puppy with his head back chasing after a ball. Uh, Ennis Ward with the ball. Yeah, it's amazing how loose the, the ball's carried. Um, ball security is a nightmare if you, view, if you judge it on uh, modern 30 kg. If, if you judge it on modern, uh, by modern standards. Uh, heartbreak's never far away for a rugby league fan and arguably the most important match ever staged here was the World Cup final in 1970, um, which brought with it shock and ignominy, probably in equal measure. Um, post the Lions tour, um, and, and a win here in the, in the first meeting in the tournament. Uh, Great Britain were expected to take the trophy home. Um, and actually, it, it developed into something that almost was a stain on the game. And John Atkinson scored Great Britain's only try, but was also sent off at the end of the game and the only time in his career. I think you were here and were chastened by the whole experience. The, t the Ashes series of that year, the 1970 Ashes series, you had to wait a week to see it on grandstand because there was no, you know, satellite TV was in its infancy. So you didn't see anything live. The, the, the pictures came back. You watched them the following week on grandstand. So it was this fantastic thing to win the Ashes. And you know, I was naive and young, so I assumed this, was, this would happen throughout the rest of my life. I didn't realize it was the only time I'd ever see it. But that sense of disappointment came for, that mat for the World Cup final because, so it was basically the same team that had defeated the, the Aussies in, in Sydney in the third test. Um, so, yeah, expect we're going to win the World Cup and Britain dominate, but we never do it and the Aussies come and it's bad tempered. And so it was, as a, as a child, it was my first real taste of rugby league disappointment. And about what it feels like when you, when you don't win when you expect to win. I must have been far worse for the players, but, you know, for, for eight-year-old me, it was, it, was just, uh, it was awful. Set you up for a career in the sport. <laughs> um, and to, to coin a phrase that I think Mr Stevenson has used many times in his commentary, um, the national papers the next day called it Thugby League. Um, and we, we got roundly condemned for the fact that on national television, um, all we'd had was a succession of fights. 
Yeah, it, it didn't do the game any good. And also in Leeds, Ronnie Teeman, who was a councillor at the time, was then obviously has, uh, played a big role in the, in rugby league in Leeds and was the director of Bramley. Uh, Ronnie Teeman was so incensed, he's, he, um, he called on the council to stop rugby league being played in schools because uh, of the violence in the, far, in the, in the World Cup final. It all blew over, but obviously it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a good fit. The whole of today is about sort of making history, and the 1982 Invincibles certainly did that. Uh, by the time of the third test here, we knew that the game had irrevocably changed. Uh, we were taught a harsh reality that the sport had changed forever in terms of athleticism and skill, um, and some would say maybe we haven't even caught up with that yet. Uh, the, the older guard from the second test who were replaced come this match, uh, Brian Noble, who's in the room, made his debut, uh, and for a time it was the closest we came. At least we scored a try. Uh, until Lee Crooks' dismissal made the impossible task even more so. Um, were the 82 Aussies the best side you'd ever seen? And, and was it such a wake-up call? I think, well, I think as a team, um, yeah, because they have to be the greatest side that's ever played here because of the impact they had on the game. Um, it's, it's almost like... There's rugby league before 1982 and there's rugby league after. And I know some of these things are already in place, like the 1970, you could see some of the signs were there during the 1971, 1979 Lions tour that when we lost 3-0. Um, but yeah, to come here, and it was like, it was, almost, it was almost like visitors from another planet, I think, some of the, some of the football they played. Um, and it wasn't because we didn't have the talented players uh, or the committed players. It was just because they... They played at such a level, and their skill levels were were higher. They played at such an intensity. Um, it's still, you know, it's, I know people in Australia say, "Oh no, it can't be the greatest ever kangaroos," because, you know, was Max Krilich really the greatest ever hooker? Well, pretend, possibly not. But in terms of a team playing together, unbelievable. So yeah, this is the lead up to our only try in 1982. Again, lots of familiar figures here to have pushed that ball out wider, I think. Mick Crane, on oh, a beautiful ball. Here's a chance, Steve Evans going for the line. He's in. Yes. What a try. And my word, what a smile on his face. He pulls Great Britain back to 14 points to eight. And the crowd go wild. We've waited a long, long time for that try. Sadly, it ended up 32-8 to Australia. That was our, our yeah. finest moment. It never yeah, got any better than that. in the last 15 minutes. I mean, hopefully, uh, this chat and these clips have given you a flavour of the, the pantheon Headingley is in rugby league annals. Uh, there's more to come, not least with the Brazil women making their debut here in next year's World Cup. It'll be another fitting chapter in a chronicle that's set to run and run. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Gary, to say a few words at this really quite wonderful event. It's an honour for me to have been invited, a genuine pleasure for me to be in this room with such legends of our game. History and heritage is very important to the sport of rugby league. I often talk about how our great sport was forged out of Britain's industrial heritage. Everybody knows the famous story of how the Northern Union broke away, arising from a dispute over payment of players. That battle was a microcosm of the struggle between industrialization and professionalism embodied by rugby league and Corinthian amateurism embodied by rugby union. The rapid growth of rugby league from its formation, its adoption throughout the northern industrial towns, and the way it acted as a magnet for civic pride and achievement helped to cement rugby league as the sport of, in of Britain's industrial heartland in the north. I often say too that if you want to understand and visualize Britain's industrial, economic, and social history, then simply study the story of rugby league. From its formation, the result of an old-fashioned industrial-related dispute. Through growth, professionalization, urbanization, civic pride, 
service and sacrifice, hardship and deprivation, discipline and deference, modernism, mass entertainment and pop culture, decline and subsequent rebirth and reinvention. Rugby league has encapsulated the story of this country over the last century and a quarter. Rugby league respects and honors its heritage more than many other sports. It reveres its heroes, its great servants, and it remembers its famous occasions. But that doesn't mean that we live in the past. Our heritage may be viewed through the sepia tones of Britain's industrial past, but our future is seen through the color, vibrancy, passion, and diversity of our modern game. And nowhere is that better exemplified than in this great stadium. We're here in this magnificent sporting arena. As you've heard from Phil and uh, from Tony, this location has been a significant venue for many of the great occasions on which our sport has been built. But is also a fitting and inspiring setting for the great chapters of our sport still to be written. In 131 years time, what wonderful battles will have been fought out on that pitch and what role will they play in the story of our game in the next century? Another successful byproduct of a respect for heritage is that your heritage helps to cement the values and the culture of the sport. It sets who we are and how we live. Rugby league already has strong values and let me adapt slightly our rugby football league values to talk about how I see the values and culture of this club and this great city. United, the strength of unity, mutual respect and support in this club always comes across whenever you come here. The sporting teams in this city are a real source of pride. Leeds United and Leeds Rhinos share the same fans, the same songs, and before Don Revy came along, they shared the same colours, and they share in each other's success. The city reveres those who have built its sports clubs. Statues, images, and murals adorn your stadiums and your suburbs, reminding us that today's and tomorrow's heroes are playing on the shoulders of those who came before them professional. There is a commitment to excellence and a winning culture. Embracing Yorkshire grit and bloody mindedness to create team spirits and a united front to achieve sporting success. Winning and then moving on to try and win again the next season. Excellence. A dedication to being the best that you can be. An outstanding stadium that we are in that sets the tone for success a culture dedicated to excellence both on and off the field, reverence for the teams and the players that have won in the past, pride in the badge, representing the club with honour, celebrating success and using that success to reach out and inspire the local community, and respect. This city and this club, as we have seen today, respects those who have been and come before them, those who have served with distinction, and those who have put their heart, time, and essence into the sport. Nowhere is that better exemplified than right now, today, when the suffering of one of your heroes has inspired his teammates, colleagues, and friends to incredible acts of generosity and endurance, to strangers and friends alike joining together to challenge themselves and raise funds and awareness. All of this has raised millions of pounds and has motivated the government for the first time ever to put 50 million pounds, the first proper grant of any kind, into MND research. It shows that we look for and look after our own, a community spirit that endures in everything that we do. As the chair of the RFL, those of us who are on the board know that we are simply the temporary stewards of our sport, guiding it through its next few chapters. We've inherited the story from those who came before us across a century and a half, and we aim to hand it on with new stories, 
written to those who will come next. So for me, as chair of the RFL, it has been a privilege to be part of this day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Gary, to be here. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining in what I hope will be a memorable occasion. Thank you. And so uh, to bring the, con the uh, formalities to a conclusion, uh, and, and thanks once again for, for everybody being here, I'd like to welcome the president of Leeds Rhinos, Mr. Andrew Thurkel. First of all, on behalf of everyone at Leeds Rhinos, we would like to thank you all for giving up your precious time and being here today to witness another special day in the history of this, of this famous stadium. We have all been in the presence today of some of the game's finest ever players um, and administrators, um, and it has been an absolute privilege for us all to be here, I am sure. We also uh, have another thing in our favour. Uh, our sport is rugby league, and as Steve-O famously kept reminding us, rugby league is the greatest game in the world. All it leaves is to say thank you for being here today. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and have a safe journey home. Thank you indeed, everybody. Good afternoon.